This is an automated message on behalf of the Earth Council. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to build your own version of the retro arcade classic Space Invaders. Participation in this assignment is required in order for you to earn your Level 1 Unity Game Developer Certificate. Hi everybody and welcome to Assignment 1 of an Introduction to Unity for Programmers brought to you by the Game Institute. Now a word of caution before embarking on this assignment it is assumed that you have watched all of the videos from Modules 1 and 2 of this workshop and that you have a good understanding of how we built our breakout clone Balls of Steel. In fact you should be in a position right now where you could build your own breakout game and hopefully many of you did just that whilst following along with me in the Module 2 videos. So what exactly is this assignment and its sub-series of videos all about? Well, this is where you not only get to test everything you've learned so far by building another retro classic, but it's also a chance for us to see how you are progressing with your studies. On assignment completion, you will upload the final build of your project for us to test, and if the game meets all of the criteria set out in this assignment, you will receive your first Game Institute Unity Game Developers Certificate. Now in this assignment, you are going to build a Space Invaders clone, and on screen right now, you can see some of the in-game scenes of the game that I built for this assignment, and I called mine Invasion Earth. This is essentially the game that we want you to build. Of course, you can use different graphics and different sounds and different effects, but this is essentially what we want from you. Now, you can download the final build of my game. It's currently only in Windows EXE format. Uh, you can get this from the training area, and I want you to play it so that you understand the features that we're going to implement and the various scenes that are going to comprise this game. Furthermore, in this sub-series of videos, I'm going to show you how I built this game from scratch, along with all of the development decisions I made and why I made them. So, you are by no means on your own in this assignment. Therefore, these videos are going to be a little bit like a developer's diary that will contain all of the information that you will need to build your own versions of this game. Now, I've had a few emails from students in the past that have stated that whilst they really enjoyed watching the Balls of Steel tutorials and they understood everything that I did and why I did them, they still found themselves not really knowing where to start when beginning their next project completely on their own. And of course, this is totally to be expected. This is a skill that you only earn through experience and repetition. The more games you make, the more you will begin automatically approaching and solving problems with a game designer's mindset. Therefore, in these videos, I will focus not only on the code itself, but also why I thought certain systems would be needed and implemented in such a way. Now, another word of caution, I will not be giving you the full source code to this project until you have submitted your assignment for review. To do so would be like providing somebody with the answer sheet before an exam and also ticking all the boxes for them. The video will already discuss virtually all of the code that needs to be written, but it's still vitally important for your development growth that you build this project yourself. It is often misleading to watch somebody building a game and think, yeah, I get what he's doing, I don't actually need to do that myself. But actually, you will often find that when you do try doing it yourself, there will be little complications or problems that you didn't anticipate. Perhaps something was omitted from the video discussion. It is figuring out the solutions to these problems that will eventually transform you into a competent and hireable game developer. So let me sum up this assignment and its associated videos in a nutshell. Number one, the videos of this assignment will show you how I built Invasion Earth. Number two, you can download and play the final build of Invasion Earth, but you will not initially get any of the project source. Number three, you will develop this game using the videos as a guide and will submit the final build of your game to us for review. 
Number four, we will also be looking at how resourceful you are as an indie developer. There is a big world wide web out there with lots of free sounds, art and graphics, as well as many free tools that will help you do things such as create skybox textures. Now, I'm certainly going to give you some pointers on where some of this stuff can be found, but as game developers, the search engine really is your best friend. Don't bother sending us a game with placeholder cubes for invaders and say, Hey Gary, I'm not an artist, or with no music or sound effects, there are lots of stuff out there on the net that you can use. A lack of effort in this area could certainly result in assignment failure. Number 5. Assuming a favourable review of your game by us, you will receive your Game Institute's Unity Game Developers Certificate. Number 6. Whilst you are encouraged to seek help from the community if you are struggling on a certain area of this assignment, do not ask me or any other instructor employed at Game Institute for any code or for a quick pass. Once again, this is like asking the teacher for the answer sheet in an exam. This whole assignment is all about getting you comfortable developing unaided and readying you for the more complex workshops that are to follow, where it will not always be possible to give you fully completed source projects or walk you through script code line by line. But one thing's for sure, by the end of this assignment, however painful it may be for some of you that are new to all of this, you will certainly know a heck of a lot more about writing games in Unity and feel much more comfortable working within the Unity environment. So let's get started. So let's assume that I am working for a software company and my boss has said to me, Gary, because that's my name, I want you to create a game based on Space Invaders. Now the first thing that I would do is either try to play the original game if possible or check out YouTube and see if I can find any footage of the original game. This allows me to get a feel for the scope of the project from an assets perspective and the important gameplay features that should be copied over into my version of the game. Now let me just say that we are not after an exact copy of the original game from you okay so there will be plenty of space left for you to get creative. However, there are some important gameplay features that we want you to maintain and I will list these a little later on when we review the gameplay. For now though, I want to look at the assets that we are going to need to create. I can see from looking at this video that the main game level is comprised of five types of asset. We have the player cannon, number one. We also have the destroyable bunkers that the player can use to take cover from alien fire, number two. We have the main wave of invaders which contains three different types of invader, that's assets three, four and five. And we also have a mystery invader that periodically goes across the top of the screen, so that's asset number six. So all of this seems quite manageable. Now, let me just say at this point that you by no means have to copy these exact invaders. Some of you will be very competent in 3D modeling packages, so feel free to let your creativity run wild. Others of you might have friends or fellow team members that are also competent modelers. That's also fine, feel free to recruit them for your asset creation. If you are not a modeler yourself, or if you don't know any modelers that can help you, some of you might choose to slap down a couple of bucks and purchase some assets for your project. That's also fine. Remember, you only have to submit the final build of your project to us for review, so you shouldn't have any problems with asset distribution legalities. However, what I decided to do was build all the core assets myself, and all from within Unity and I'm going to show you how I did just that in a moment. Okay, so back to our asset review. The mystery invader that flies across the top of the screen doesn't animate, so I won't animate mine either. A single mesh of a flying saucer would do the job just fine here. Now the main wave of invaders, and as I said, there are three invader types, each invader has two frames of animation, and that gives them their walking sideways, sort of a bit like a crab animation. We can simply create two meshes for each of these invaders. A separate mesh for each pose that that invader can be in. Then, in our game, we could just alternatively enable one frame and disable the other each time the invader is supposed to move. 
whereas traditional movie animation is accomplished by showing different images, I will accomplish my simple 3D animation using a similar technique, by simply showing different meshes. At this point in the design process I had an idea. I did a search online for a Space Invaders sprite sheet and found this image. This not only gave me something to copy from my model construction phase, but it also gave me an idea about how I might construct my models in Unity by representing each pixel in the sprite sheet as a 3D cube. I would simply need to place a cube wherever there was a black pixel in the sprite sheet and I would have a very good 3D facsimile of the invaders. Now I'm going to show this construction phase in just a moment, but for now just know that I also used a script that I got from the Unity community and I'll make this available to you uh, in the training area. And this script allowed me, once I had constructed my invaders of many cubes, to collapse all of those cubes down into a single mesh for efficiency. And it also allowed me to save that mesh as a project asset and I'm, I'm going to look at how to use this script in a moment also. Of course, once we had all of our invader meshes created, we could then start constructing our invader prefabs. The player's cannon is easy enough to create also, as it doesn't animate, and I use the same technique of constructing something out of multiple cubes in Unity, and then collapsing them down into a single mesh. And for the player and the alien missiles, well, they could be represented as elongated quads. Now the bunkers, they require a bit more thought. You see, they also need to be destroyable piece by piece, which isn't something we are often used to doing in 3D games. Now I did this by building my bunkers out of tiny subcubes, much like the initial build phase of my invaders, uh, except I don't collapse all the cubes down into a single mesh at the end of the build process. Each of these subcubes has its own box collider that is collision sensitive to the missiles of both the aliens and the player. I thought that what I could do is, is when a missile hits anything on the bunker layer, essentially one of the bunker subcubes, I could then turn on a randomly sized sphere trigger at the position of impact. This would allow me to scoop up not only the cube that was hit by the missile, but also a random number of surrounding cubes which we can then disable in the scene whilst simultaneously instantiating a particle system at that location to make a nice explosion. On the screen now you can see this in action in Invasion Earth and I think you'll agree with me that the destructible bunkers in 3D worked out quite nicely. Finally, in Invasion Earth None of the core graphics have any textures or complex lighting or shadows. In fact, the core game scenes uses the vertex lit rendering path. This will help it run very quickly and although I haven't tested it yet, should make it an ideal candidate for porting to a mobile device. Of course we would need to change the player's control mechanism as mobile devices don't commonly have a spacebar or a cursor keys and that's the current control mechanism for the game. Finally, you will notice that in Invasion Earth, I have various waves of aliens attacking in Earth's solar system. So at the beginning, you are protecting Earth, but if you push them back from Earth by completing level 1 and moving on to the next level, you will see the backdrop change to indicate that you are defending Mars. And if you complete that level, you then push them back to Jupiter, and etc, etc. Now in order to do this, I was also going to need a simple way to create some nice spacey looking backdrops. Now you don't have to do the same as me and have all the various planets and all the various backdrops, but you are going to want some nice spacey looking backgrounds to make your game look cool. Now many years ago I found an excellent free tool for generating space images called Spacescape, made by a very talented programmer called Alex C. Peterson. Thank you Alex for this great tool and his website is on the screen now. It also has a tutorial video on getting started with the tool so make sure you check it out. This tool allows you to generate space backdrops by adding layers of noise in different colors and formations. Furthermore, it also outputs six seamless textures that can be used for texturing skyboxes in Unity. Now, if you don't know what a skybox is yet, that's fine because I know we haven't covered them in modules one and two of this workshop, but don't worry, you're gonna see me using those later and I'll explain a little bit what they are then. 
I use a skybox on the title screen of Invasion Earth so that I can have the camera endlessly rotating and therefore have my space background endlessly scrolling. Pretty cool, huh? So far so good. Our review of the assets needed hasn't thrown anything up at us that we wouldn't be able to handle as lone developers. So what about sound? Once again, you are free to incorporate any sound effects that you want or even make your own. However, after a bit of searching on the internet, I found the website www.classicgaming.cc forward slash classics. This shows a list of classic arcade games and if we click on Space Invaders and then on the sounds link, hey look at that. All of the sound effects from the original game right there for you to download. Now I didn't use all of them from here because the explosion sounds, they were a little low quality but I did use the mystery ship sound effect, the four fast invader sound effects, that's the four alternating tones that are played when the invader walks. I also used the mystery ship sound effect, the player shooting sound effect and the invader death sound effect. Like I said though, feel free to use your own sound or only some of these but this is a very good place to start. A search on the internet or on YouTube will often turn up many really good sound resources for things such as explosions. And of course you can use free audio editing tools such as Audacity for example to clean up your sound files or to clip out some sounds that you like out of a larger composition if needs be. Now these are the sorts of tools that you're going to want to have near you at all times if you're a lone developer. Finally, music. Now, I know that many of you will not be in a position where you can compose your own space themes, and even if you have the ability, you probably don't have the time. However, a search on the internet also turned up some really cool sci-fi-like tunes that I was able to use. In particular, I found some cracking soundtrack files by a guy whose SoundCloud name was ALXD. All of his music is free for you to use as long as you credit him in your game, so make sure that you do just that if you use any of them. You can visit his SoundCloud page at soundcloud.com forward slash ALXD music and play or download the files right there from the web page. The two tunes I used was one called The Suicide Mission for the start of the game. You can hear that playing now. And I also used another of his tunes for the closing credit scene that was called Event Horizon. And you can hear that playing now also. You will no doubt recognize this from the closing credit sequence of Invasion Earth. So then, we now have access to high quality sci-fi space music to use in our game. We have access to many sound effects that we can also use. We have access to a skybox generation tool that will allow us to generate some cool looking space backdrops for our scenes. And as I said, I've decided to build my core invader assets right inside Unity itself. So next up, I want you to stop the video and I want you to go off now and collect all of your sounds and music that you wish to use in your game. Now in the next section, I'm going to start creating the invader assets within Unity and I'm also going to import all of the sounds and music that I used in Invasion Earth. And after that, we're going to revisit that original game footage of Space Invaders and that's when we're going to plan out all of the systems and the scripts that we're going to need to implement to support the features of the game. Okay, then let's get started. Let's open up Unity and create a brand new project. I'm going to create this on my desktop because that's where I store everything. And I'm going to call this new uh, project folder Invaders Student Assignment. And from the standard assets, I think the only package that I'm going to import is the particles. Yeah, because I'm going to need those, I think, for the basis of my explosions and special effects. Now, when I first create a Unity project, I like to go and create a lot of folders that I just know through experience I'm going to need to help organize my project. So I'll create folders to store textures, materials, uh, prefabs, uh, even though we haven't got any yet, I know I'm going to be creating some. Um, and I, I want to keep my project as organized as possible. So you can see I've got a folder for models, um, for scripts, and also one for scenes, and probably one more for sounds. I may need to come back and create some more later. Uh, and then what I'm going to do in that sounds folder is I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to drag over all of the sounds that I uh, found on the internet 
many of those that I showed you and I'm going to drag them into my project and that includes the music tracks that I showed you uh, Event Horizon and the Suicide Mission and also all of the sound effects that I downloaded from that classic gaming.cc website and uh, also as well there's a lot of other explosions that I downloaded as well uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a subfolder in audio I'm going to call it music and because I like to keep my music audio file separate from my sound effects. I'll just drag those in there. Keep the project nice and tidy. And then I'm going to select each of these audio files, just check the import settings and make sure we don't want any of these being 3D sounds. And you can see I'm testing playing it after I hit apply. And you'll notice here I've actually got several explosion sounds. And the reason I do that is because if we have lots of explosions, all being sort of triggered in quick succession, it can sound very robotic and artificial. So what I like to do is randomly select my explosion from a larger number of explosion sounds. So it's different every time. Okay, now we have the little invader sounds. This is the, the four tones that uh, are made when the invader animates. Um, these get played quicker and quicker as the invaders move more quickly. And once again, these are all um, 2D sounds uh, that are loaded into memory as WAV files. They're very small, so it's not going to be a big deal. And this sound here is the sound that the invader makes when it's going across the top of the screen, you know, the UFO. Uh, drilling down into my music, we can see that it's currently a 3D sound. We don't want that, so untick that. Our camera's not moving anywhere, so we don't want any 3D positioning audio. So this is the music that's played on the closing credits. Uh, now, I've currently got that as a WAV file. I don't want that because it's quite big, so I'm going to set that as uh, a compressed file, and that's going to bring it down from about... 15 plus meg down to around about two and a half megabyte as you can see not really any difference and i'll do the same for the other audio file as well this is the main menu uh, so once again 2d sound um and compressed in memory and i've actually made some changes to this i actually put a load of uh, voices i got my girlfriend kirsty to help me and um made it sound like there were lots of sort of news reports going on over the beginning of the track to give it just a little bit more atmosphere that's it playing now <laughs> oh I do like play acting what can I say okay so next thing I do now is save the scene because obviously we've created a project uh, but we haven't saved the scene yet so I'm going to save that in my scenes folder and I call this the construct scene okay because this scene isn't going to be part of our actual build what it's going to be is a scene that I use just to build things such as our invaders so I'm also going to create some subfolders inside the scripts folder I'm going to call this third party and I'm going to use this to drag over those third party scripts I was telling you about. These are the, the scripts that I got from the Unity community that would allow me to collapse down all of the cubes that we're going to build our invaders from into a single mesh asset in our project. In fact, while I'm here, I'm also going to create a few other folders. Um, I generally like to place my scripts into folders based on what scene they're used in. So I'll have one for the main menu one for the game level. The game level is like the main scene that contains the wave of invaders, the kind of the gameplay. And one for closing credits. And uh, for any scripts that don't apply to just any one scene, I'll store those in the parent scripts folder. And that's how I know that they'll apply to everything. Also, I don't know what scripts I'm going to need yet, but uh, that's what we're going to do uh, shortly. But let's build our invaders next. So I'm going to call up the sprite sheet and start humbly by adding our first cube to the scene. And I'm going to remove the box collider from it, okay? We don't want our individual cubes to be collidable. And I'm also going to make sure that it's at zero, zero, zero in the world with zero rotation. And position the camera in front of it. And looking at the sprite sheet, I can see that I'm going to do the top left pixel first, which is minus, oops, it's moved to the right. That means I'm looking at the back of it, not the front of it. So I'm going to have to move the camera around. I want to be looking at the front of it so that negative values on the x-axis move the cube left and so I don't have to keep adding cubes and then removing the box colliders you can see what I'm doing is I'm just selecting the cubes when I place them and I'm copying and pasting them so that I'm kind of adding new cubes to the scene that already have their box colliders removed so you can see the first row looking at the sprite sheet I had a pixel at minus three and positive three for this particular invader so I place a cube at minus three and positive three and for the second row 
Once again, you can see on the wire I've moved down a row here to from 0 to minus 1. You can see that I have cubes at minus 2 and positive 2. So now I'm going to move on to row 3, which contains just one cube, which is centered uh, in the invader. So I need to place that at 0 on the x-axis. I think that needs to be, what was that, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 wide. So I adjust the scale of the cube to 7. Hey, you can see it's starting to take shape. So now we're going to go on to the next row. So I'm going to duplicate um, another cube. Uh, we've done three rows so far, so we're at minus two. So we're going to move this next one I've just pasted down to minus three. And I'm going to make this first bit like the middle section between the eyes. So that should be in the center of the invader, zero on the x-axis, and should have a scale of three because it's three wide. And then I'm going to paste another copy of that in to be the, the sort of part of the invader's head that's either side of the eyes because what we want to do is leave two spaces for the eyes that doesn't look quite right does it um, oh it needs to be minus 3.5 yeah I got a bit confused there because obviously with a cube it's it's sort of extents are minus 0 0.5 and positive 0 0.5 so as you can see there I've created a cube I've placed it at minus 3.5, but it's too wide. And I'm going to copy that over to the other side by simply pasting it and then flipping the sign on the X component of its position. And now I'm going to create its kind of the longest part of its body on row 5. So let me move that down to minus 4, and that needs to be, I think, 11. Is it 11? Yes, that's right. So this is kind of like the bottom of his head that leads into his shoulders. And now either side, his arms need to come down whilst his body is continuing down. So I'll create two more. No, I'll create one more cube. I'll move this down to the next row. Where am I? And I'll set this to seven wide. Yeah, it's the same as the cube in row three. And I need to create two other smaller cubes to go, to sort of continue the arms down on either side. And what I like to do sometimes, if I can't be bothered to figure out the math, is move it roughly into space using the transform gizmo. And then it gives you an idea. Like you can see there, you know, it was a 5.1, for example, or minus 5.1. So I could tell that meant I needed to set it to minus 5. Uh, once again, copy, paste, and flip the sign on the X component of its position to make a copy on the right-hand side. We need to continue the arms down again. So I'm going to duplicate both of those cubes and move them down another row onto row minus 6. It doesn't really matter where the origin of this mesh is at the moment because that's going to change, I believe, when we combine it all into a single mesh anyway. Um, and I need to create um, some more cubes in the middle where the legs are going to begin. Is that right? Have I done that wrong? Yeah, they need to go up and then they need to go over. So I've... Let me uh, copy and paste those a minute and then move them in. You'll see what I mean in a minute when I get this thing into position. There you go. <laughs> Touch and go there for a minute. And same here, this one needs to be at uh, 3. So minus 3 and positive 3. So now all that's left to do is the very final row of this particular frame where we do its feet. They look more like flippers. And uh, as you can see from the sprite sheet, each one of these is a cube that is too wide. Two pixels wide in the sprite sheet, or for us, two units wide. Is that right? That's not right, is it? Doesn't look right. What have I done wrong here? Oh, I see. It's not supposed to be flush. Well, I've already copy and pasted the other leg, so let me just position the right leg as well a minute, and then I'll move them into position. Uh, yeah, well, they need to be moved over like that, you see, so they've just got a very small kind of diagonal link with the leg. Just correct the left one. There you go. Okay, so that is our first invader frame done, or should I say frame one of invader one. So what I'm going to do now is create a container game object and parent all of these cubes to it. And that's very important because in a minute when we add that uh, combiner script, that script works by collecting the meshes of all of its children and combining them into a single mesh that is created and stored in a mesh filter in the parent object. So I'm going to create all of those cubes and uh, parent them to the invader. There you go. Nice and easy to move around now and disable or enable if we need to. Remember, this construct scene is not going to be 
in the actual final build we're just using this as a kind of a doodle pad really so i'm going to duplicate that invader and i'm going to work on frame two you can see i've disabled the object that we created for frame one and i've renamed the duplicate invader one underscore b and looking at the second frame for this particular invader in the sprite sheet i can see that in this particular pose the arms go up rather than down so i'll select those cubes move them up like so do the same for the the bottom ones of the arms move those up as well actually looking at the frame for the second frame for this invader the arms actually go up twice as long so I'm going to add another cube on either side of the arms there um, and now what we need to do is adjust the legs now the legs looking at the sprite sheet when they're turned in they're too wide but actually they're only one wide um, in this particular frame when they go outwards. So I'm going to move it into position. Uh, I'm going to change the scale so it's only one unit wide. And that needs to be at four. There you go. So we've got a small link like that. And the same for the other side. And the only thing we have to do now is add two more cubes under the armpits. If you look at the frame, you'll see, I guess it's the alien armpit. Do aliens even have armpits? It's one of life's big questions, isn't it, really? It's not really so much, is there life out there? It's more sort of profound than that. It's, is there alien life out there? And does it have armpits? Okay, so we've now got our two frames. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to enable both of them. <laughs> so we can just see, and the animation is not going to work yet because, you know, when, when I enable and disable one, we're seeing both of them on top of each other. But what I do want to do um, is just check that they are occupying the same space and they absolutely are overlaying properly. So what I need to do now in order for that combiner script to work in a moment is I need to select each of those parent objects and add an empty mesh filter component to each of those container objects. So I've done it for the first frame. Now I'm going to add a mesh container for the second frame. Sorry, a mesh filter. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag over that third party script I was talking about, the one that combines all of the children into a single mesh and stores that mesh filter at the parent. And the script I want to copy over is called Combine Children Extended. You can see I've dragged it over onto the first invader. Actually, let me disable the second invader for now. So we've only got one. And then there's a little cog in this script. If you pull it down, you'll see that one of the options you get is Combine Now. And when you choose that, this script will collect all of the faces from all of those child cubes and it will store it in a brand new mesh. And if you look at the mesh filter now in the parent object, it now has a new mesh called Combined Mesh. And in fact, we can test that this has worked by going over to the hierarchy and disabling all of the cubes that we know made up our mesh. And you'll see that when I disable them, look, it is still there. And that's because a copy of it is now, uh, a combined copy of it is now stored in the mesh filter of the parent object. So what I want to do now is save this off as an project asset. So once again, go into that cog, you'll see there's a save mesh asset option, which allows me to choose the folder. I'm going to choose the models folder in my project and I will call it invader one because it's the first invader and a, a meaning it's the first frame. And there you go. And if you look in my models folder now in my project, you'll see we now have an invader mesh filter asset ready to be added to any other game object that we care to create. So now, of course, I need to do the same for the second invaders frame. So I'm going to enable... No, I'm going to just... That's frame one. Sorry. I'm going to enable frame two. And I'm going to, once again, I'm going to drag... it. We've already added the mesh filter, uh, but I'm going to drag over that combined children extended script. In the drop down, I'm going to choose combine now. Now I'm going to turn off all of the cubes in its uh, hierarchy just to make sure that the, a valid copy does exist in the containers mesh. And then I'm going to save that combined mesh once again as a project asset by choosing save mesh asset from the pull down. And I choose my models folder. And no points for guessing what I'm going to call this. Invader1 underscore B. Oh yeah. And there they are. We have two invaders in our project. And what's quite interesting is if I open up the preview window and then I select between them, you can see what the animation is going to look like. Oops. Uh, oops. <laughs> Sorry, clicked out of it. So there you go. Just by selecting them, we get an idea. And you can see it really does work. Perfect. Now, of course, those invaders that are in our scene, 
those sort of game objects in our construct scene, we could just delete them. We don't need them anymore. We've already created the mesh assets, but I like to keep them in there because if I ever want to come back and make changes to it, then I've got the source uh, sort of construct there and I wouldn't have to rebuild it again. But I am going to disable them. So what we need to do now is we need to do that for all of the other invaders. So we've got two other invaders. So that's four frames for the two other invaders in the wave. And we also want to create the UFO that goes along the top of the screen and the gun that the player is going to use to sort of fire from. Um, now, I'm not going to show me doing all this because it is just a case of placing blocks. So I'm going to pause the video now. And when I come back, I should have created all of the assets. And this folder should contain Invader 1A, Invader 1B, Invader 2A, Invader 2B, and so on. Okay folks, I'm back and if you look in my models folder, I now have several meshes. So let me open up the preview window so we can see them. We of course have Invader 1A and 1B, the two frames of the first Invader that you saw me build in the last section. But we also have 2A and 2B now, which is the two frames that are used for the crab-like Invader. We have 3A and 3B, the two meshes that are going to be used to comprise the animation for the squid-like invader. And we have Invader 4, which is just a single mesh that's going to be used for the UFO that goes across the top of the screen. And I also built the player's cannon, or the gun, and uh, once again, just using the same technique. So what we're going to do now is we're going to build the bunkers, or the bases as I call them, out of all of those tiny cubes. So let me turn off the invader that's currently in the construct scene. And before we do this, um, let's go to the edit menu and choose snap settings and make sure that movement X, Y, and Z are all set to one unit because when you move objects in unity holding down the control key, the, the object will actually snap to these snap settings. And we're going to be building our, our bases or our bunkers out of lots of tiny one unit wide and high cubes. So these snap settings are going to make it really easy for us to copy, paste, and move. And uh, you'll see what I mean. So let's start humbly by creating our first cube um, and making sure that this is at zero, zero, zero in the world. This is going to be the very center of the top row of the cubes comprising our bunker. We want to leave the box collider intact because, uh, you know, this all of the tiny subcubes need to be collidable. Now, what I'm doing is I'm doing Control C to copy to the clipboard. Okay, after I select it, Control V to paste, and then holding Control down, I move it across, and you can see that cube that I've just pasted is snapped to the correct grid position, nice and flush against its neighbor. So every time I place a new cube, I do Control C to copy to clipboard, Control V to paste, and holding the Control key down, I move it across. And this allows me to very quickly, like I'm doing now, um, create a line of cubes. Now, in my Invasion Earth game, the bunkers are actually comprised of 19 rows of 27 cubes. So I've just placed 13 cubes to the right of the center cube that I place. I'm now going to copy those, paste them, and then holding down the control key, move them to the left of the center cube. And now I have my complete row of 27 cubes. So I can now do control C, control V to copy this row. And then holding down the control key, I can then move that uh, copied version down to create the next row. All I'm doing at the moment is Every time I move a row down, I'm doing Control Z, Control V, then holding the control to move that pasted copy down to the next row. And remember, holding that control key is what makes them snap to the grid and gives us, um, you know, a nice tight fit of our cubes. So I need to go down here and make sure that I've placed 19 of them. And then once I've got my big kind of square base, what I'll do is I'll start then selecting the, the cubes in the top left and top right corners and start chiseling some of them away um, so that I start to get some kind of you know beveled edges and stuff. So that's my basic cube done. So I'm now going to concentrate on the top right corner. And if I look at my, I've made some notes here. If I look at my original version, I think I started from about five rows down and just drew like a diagonal line up. So all I'm trying to do is take the squareness out of this corner. So let me unselect these, like so. Ah, makes it hard to select that one sometimes because the gizmo is in the way. Okay, I've done that slightly wrong. I've taken one cube out too many. Let me deselect that. Now press the delete key, 
Now I have just those corner cubes selected and voila, we now have uh, the corner exactly as they are in Invasion Earth. So of course we need to now do the same to the left hand side of our base. So um, once again, what I'm going to do here is a different technique actually. I'm just going to draw up a line of the, no, so I can, there you go, that's easier. Just draw the line out, take out the line and then just mop up the stragglers like so. I'm just clicking on them to select them and then pressing the delete key to remove them from the scene. So I'm starting with a lot more cubes and I'm you know deleting the ones I don't want. So what I've done now is I've selected like a large section of the, the bottom piece in the middle and I've removed it. And I'm just trying to sort of shape this like an arch really. Now of course you can shape your bases however you want. Uh, but this is, I'm trying to keep this as close to possible as how I did it in uh, Invasion Earth. So once again, I think I took out another three rows here. Press the delete key. Uh, gone. I probably need to come up here, take out another two rows maybe, yeah. And then I'll delete those. And then I'll just take out three more cubes at the very tip of it. And there you go, we have our basic bunker shape. So. Let me now select all of the cubes that I've placed making up that bunker and parent them to a container object. So I've got to create that container game object by first of all creating an empty game object. I'm going to rename this base. I tend to call them base, not bunkers. Um, and very important is that I zero out its position. We don't want the container object offsetting the cubes that we've placed in any way. Um, and now I've got my container object ready. I just need to select all of the cubes that are comprising the bunker just drag and drop them onto the base object so that they are now children of the base object. Nice and easy like that. Beautiful. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is it looks a bit thin, doesn't it? So I'm going to adjust the Z scale of the parent container object to give it some depth. That looks pretty nice, doesn't it? And then what I'm going to do to give it a little bit more shape, because this is what I did in Invasion Earth, I'm going to actually select all of the cubes that are kind of form the inside edge of the base, like so. And I'm going to sort of scale them up a little bit more again. And if you've played Invasion Earth, you'll know this is the shape of the bunkers that I've used. Just makes them look a little less flat if I kind of extrude out the inner edge like so. I've set that to a multiply of three. Now that seems pretty extreme, but this is actually what I used in Invasion Earth. Because you've got to remember, these are going to be you know, pretty small on the screen. We're going to be pretty zoomed out. So we do wish to kind of magnify the detail so we can see it fine. Okay, so with most of the core sort of meshes created, we're going to now start creating some prefabs out of them and get them into a basic state of readiness so we can start to create our game level. Um, and before we do that, I'm also going to create some layers because we're going to need our objects to exist on different layers. So let's go to the layers list and I'm going to add a few layers here because for example I'm going to need the missiles that the invaders fire to destroy the player and the bases but not destroy the other invaders and likewise the the bases uh, need to be sensitive to both the uh, invaders missiles and the players missiles so you can see I've created an invaders layer that the aliens will be on a bases layer that the bunkers will be on I've created a player projectile and an alien projectile layer which I'll assign to the missiles that are fired by the player and the invaders respectively I'm going to create a blast radius layer which I'm going to use for that trigger that we're going to use to scoop up the cubes surrounding an impact on the bunker more on that in a moment and I've created a cannon layer for the players gun and um, yeah, and what I'm going to do is select the bunker first of all, and or the base, and I'm going to assign it to the base layer. And yes, I want that to be applied to all of the child cubes, very important. And I'm also going to create a prefab from this base. So I'm going to create a new prefab in the prefabs folder, call it base, and I've dragged my new base object onto it. And there you can see, but it's not the right color, is it? In Invasion Earth, it's actually green. So why don't we create a new material, a nice green material to apply to our prefab? So I'm going to go to the materials folder. I'm going to right click and choose create material. I'm going to call this material base. Yeah. And I'm going to set it to a green color as its main color. 
something like that and I'm going to set the shader to use the vertex lit okay because we haven't got textures we don't need per pixel lighting we're actually going for a pretty retro -y look here so now I'm going to select open up the uh, container object select all of the cubes and then I'm going to drag while they're all selected our material and drop them in the material slot in the inspector and as you can see I then click apply and those changes are applied to the base prefab and we now have a nice green base prefab in our project there it is okay so of course we need to uh, let me just press apply again to make sure I've definitely applied those changes uh, so let's create a material for our invaders I just need a white material here so I'm going to create a material I mean, we haven't actually created the invader prefabs yet uh, once again, I'll assign it the, the vertex lit shader. Probably doesn't need to be bright white. Probably grey. Yeah, like I was saying, we haven't created the actual invaders yet. We've created the meshes, but we haven't actually created game objects and prefabs out of them. So let's turn off the base and do that now. Okay, so with everything in the scene clear, I'm going to create a new game object, which is going to be the container that's going to contain two child game objects. And each of those child game objects is going to contain the mesh of a individual frame. So I've got Invader 1. I'm going to set this at 0, 0, 0 in the world. Very important. And now what I'm going to do is make two copies of this. Okay, so that's going to be these two copies are going to be become children of the invader so I'm going to rename them frame 1 and frame 2 and then I'm going to drag and drop those onto the parent invader object we've just created and now what I'm going to do is select in frame 1 and frame 2 I'm now going to add a mesh filter because we're going to need a place to store um, our invader meshes that we've created so if I can now go down to the models folder and drag over my meshes like so we're not seeing anything yet because we haven't got any mesh renderers uh, assigned to those objects so I'm gonna have to do that now so if I select frame 1 and frame 2 again and now choose uh, mesh and mesh renderer you can now see both of our child frames that are attached to the parent game objects let's assign them that invader material that we created oops there you go so that's the uh, actually it does look a bit gray let me let me put that up let me change that material so it's bright white so you can see what we've got now is we have a parent object but we have two children frame one and frame two and it's those individual child frames that we must um, sort of turn on and off to create animation and what I'm also doing here is I've selected the parent object and I'm assigning it to the invaders layer okay now the parent object invader one um, as it is at the moment needs to have a box collider assigned to it because we're going to need to detect when uh, the player's missiles you know sort of hit it um, so let me size up this box collider so it consumes the mesh fully like so and move it into the center of the invader at the moment scale up its height as well give it a bit more depth How's that looking? Not too bad. Give it a bit more uh, depth, actually. Yeah, give it a little bit more padding. But that's up to you. Um, so, you know, we have the ability now to detect when a player's bullet enters it. Um, so what we also need to do is we need to assign this a rigid body. Now, we're not going to be applying physics to this, but we do need uh, the physics system to know that it's going to be a dynamic element that needs to react to collisions so we make it a kinematic rigid body which I've done here and uh, I also just zeroed out things like the drag and angular drag although none of that is used anyway uh, when it's a kinematic rigid body and what I've also done is I've made this a trigger not a collider we don't want our players bullets to bounce off of uh, this invader we just want to know when the players bullets has entered this trigger Okay, so then we can be notified and we can, you know, play a, an explosion and, and things like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a script called Invader, okay, because I'm creating an Invader prefab at the moment. I don't really know what I want to have in these scripts yet, but I do know that I am going to want an Invader script. So let's think what I'm going to need just as a base. Well, the Invader parent is going to need to store a reference to the two frames that are its children. So we'll make two public variables to game objects 
that we can use to assign references to its two child frames and then we can do that just in the inspector um, and then of course this script then has everything it needs to do to toggle those frames on and off alternatively to play the animation. You can see I've also uh, defined a variable called points here that I've set to 20 and this is just the number of points that the player should get and then in the start function you can see I just make sure that the the parent object is active and I deactivate frame 2 and I activate frame 1 I'm going to delete the update function because I don't need it um, because what I'm thinking is that I'm going to have a, a function called update frame which is called by some higher level scene manager that's going to tell the invader to change frames and as you can see every time this is called it just toggles the currently active state of frame 1 and frame 2 so if frame 1 is on it will turn it off, if frame 2 is off it will turn it on and um, well, I'm then going to drag the invader script onto our invader game object um, so that everything is in a nice position. I'm going to drag over frame 1 and frame 2 and make those assignments to the script. Oh, let me move the game window a minute. And nothing happens at the moment, of course, because there is no update loop that is calling any functions in our invader script. Uh, but we have, you know, assigned frame 1 and frame 2 as its children. So what I'm going to do, just temporarily, because we haven't got a higher level scene manager at the moment that's going to tell this invader to change its frame, is I'm going to use the invoke repeating function and tell it to call the update frame function repeatedly every 0 0.75 seconds. And we do this by just simply saying invoke repeating. The first parameter is the name of the function to call. The second parameter is the delay to wait before calling the function, uh, just 0. I want it to be called immediately and uh, the third parameter is the delay between repeated calls of the function now, I seem to have an error there by the look of it what have I done wrong oh you can see I haven't put the F on the end of 0 0.75 so it's being uh, seen as a double not a float okay now everything's okay so if I press play now that invoke repeating should be calling the update frame function if you look in the scene view and also in the hierarchy view we can see frames 1 and 2 being alternatively enabled and disabled using that function so that's all pretty cool we have our invaders working exactly how we want them we have them in assigned to the invader layer we have the parent object uh, with references to its two child frames. So what we're going to do now is create a prefab in our prefabs folder. I'm going to call this invader type 1 oops type 1 and I'm going to drag and drop my invader onto it. Now of course that invader script is by no means complete yet but I do like to basically just get the scripts I think I'm going to need in place because now it's prefabbed I can just very easily go back make changes to that script as we begin to flesh it out. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create the next invader and we can do that by simply altering the meshes of the one we've currently got in the scene because our prefab is nicely safe. Altering this mesh isn't going to change everything. So as you can see what I've done there is I've selected frame one and I've dragged over 2A and I've now selected frame two and dragged over 2B and if we press play now we can see we've altered that mesh in the scene uh, to have two different meshes instead of uh, invaders uh, the frames for invaders one and two so once again I'm going to create a new prefab I'm going to call this invader type two I'm going to drag over that invader and make a uh, prefab of that. And remember that the prefabs that you've already created are perfectly safe. So now I've made a prefab of that, I can then alter the two meshes used by the two frames in this scene invader again to now use the two meshes used by the squid. And uh, let me just alter the trigger a minute so that it's a little bit more tightly fitting. I don't want my player's missiles to sort of register hits when they're nowhere near the invader. That's a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, so let's create a new player, a new prefab site. We'll call this invader type 3 and we'll just drag and drop this new modified scene invader over onto it. So this is something I do a lot. Um, you'll see me, I did the same technique in GI Racing when I was creating my cars. I create one invader in the scene and then I keep changing it, prefabbing it, then changing it again, prefabbing it again, and uh, we can change it as much as we want in the actual scene because once we prefab it, that prefab is safe as it is. So um, we just saw the squid animating and that looked pretty cool too. So I'm going to delete what I've got in the scene at the moment and I'm going to copy my three invaders into the scene, see what they look like. 
And of course, the nice thing about sort of prefabbing them all from that original object is they all have that invader script assigned to them, which means they all animate using, you know, the, their own frames, or should I say the meshes that were assigned to their own child frame game objects. So there they are, there they are all animating as they will look when they are in the actual game in the wave. Just delete all of those from the scene now, we don't need them. I'm going to create a new game object now. I'm going to position this, 0, 0, 0 in the world. And I'm going to use this game object to create the prefab for the player's cannon. I've called it Canon. Uh, and of course what I need to do now to this empty game object is add a mesh filter to contain our Canon mesh and also a mesh renderer like so. And then I'm going to go into my models folder. I'm going to drag over my Canon mesh, drop it in the mesh filter. We can see it now. Of course it's got no material assigned which is why it's purple. So let's go to our materials folder and drag over the same basis material that we assigned to our bunkers or our bases. And there is our nice green cannon. It's a bit thin though, isn't it? So I think what I'm going to do is uh, thicken it up a little bit. So I'm going to make it a little bit bigger actually as well on the X and Y because this gun should be pretty big, right? It's swatting aliens out of the sky. That's better. Let me just put some of the invaders in the scene next to it for reference. Just want to make sure that I've got it the right size. I don't want our gun looking too small. Yeah, that looks, that looks about right to me, uh, but I do want to make it thicker, so I'm going to scale up the uh, Z axis to 8. Yeah, that looks nice and thick now, so there you go. There's our, our cannon next to our invader. Okay, so let's select our cannon now. Uh, of course, our cannon is moving, so that also needs to have uh, a collider and be a kinematic rigid body. So I'm going to add a box collider to it. Now, if you don't know what a kinematic rigid body is, make sure you watch the intro to Unity... Module 2, I think it is, where I talk about physics, um, where I explain the difference. It's basically uh, something that we can treat as a dynamic collidable object, but it, do it isn't affected by the physics sort of forces. Oops, sorry if you heard a knock then. And I also need to add the rigid body to it. Just zero out its drag and angular drag. That's just force of habit. And set it to be a kinematic rigid body. Okay, very important. We don't want this thing kind of, you know, bouncing around under the forces of the physics system. And of course I need to assign this to the cannon layer, which I've just done. And I'm going to create a cannon script. I don't know what I'm going to put in that cannon script yet, but just like I did with the invader, let's create a placeholder script, assign it to the cannon so that when we prefab it, you know, we're prefabbing it with the script in place, which means if all we have to do is make changes to the code, it doesn't mean we have to always kind of re-prefab it or We'll keep hitting apply every time we make an update. So I'm going to create a new prefab now that I've assigned the Canon script. Once again in the prefabs folder I'm going to call this Canon and then I'm going to drag and drop my Canon onto that empty prefab to create our proper scene prefab. There you go. So we now have our Canon. Let's turn those off and I think what I'm going to do now is create the Mystery Invader. That's the flying saucer that goes across the top of the screen. So same same um, technique, create an empty game object, position it at 0, 0, 0 in the world. I'm going to call this Mystery Invader. And of course I'm going to have to add to this a mesh filter to contain the mesh data and a mesh renderer so that uh, the mesh data can be rendered. And then I'm going to go to my models folder and drag over Invader 4 which is our UFO and we'll see it appear in the scene view without a material which is why it's purple so let's actually we're gonna to have to create a new material for this because it needs to be red so let's go to our materials folder create a new material I'm gonna call this mystery invader I'm gonna assign it the vertex lit shader and I'm gonna make this a nice red color oh yes actually I'll give it a little bit of a uh, little bit of emissive red as well See what that looks like. Okay, so I'm going to select it now and then I'm just going to drag and drop that material into the mesh renderer of Invader 4. Um, and then I'm going to need to add a box collider to it. Once again, just like our normal invaders, this needs to be collidable. It needs to be a trigger. Actually, I'm just going to scale this up a little bit. 
um, make it a little bit bigger because this is supposed to be something pretty big when it goes across the top of the screen we don't want it being smaller than the actual invaders so there you go I've just made it a box trigger that's on there I'm just gonna give myself a little bit more padding on its actual uh, trigger make it give it a little bit of depth as well just so we don't have to hit it quite so exactly so there we have it now what we need to do is of course uh, actually um, before I make a prefab out of it I'm gonna do what I did with the other ones I'm gonna create a new script I'm gonna call this mystery invader and I'm just gonna drag and drop it onto the object before I prefab it I've no idea what I'm gonna put in that script yet um, we'll talk about that later but I like to have it in place when I create the prefabs so I'm going to create a new prefab in the prefabs folder. I'm going to call this mystery invader. And then of course, I'm just going to drag and drop that uh, invader that we've got in our scene onto that empty prefab to create that prefab link. Then I'm going to save my scene. In fact, I'm going to save my project as well. Why not? I think at this point we have all of our core prefabs created. So I'm going to drag them all into the screen so we can see them all together. And I think this is going to be pretty much where I'm going to stop in this lesson. There's been quite a lot to take in, and it's also at around about the uh, 60 minutes mark. So with our core assets created, what we're going to do in the next lesson is we're going to actually start creating our scripts. Actually, let me drag, let me enable the base so we can see the bases. There's all of our assets. We've got everything we need now in the next level to start mocking up our main game level and to start writing our script. So that's what we're going to do in the next lesson. Thanks for listening so far, and uh, I'll see you next time.